Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to hear more about the work that we're doing in Botswana to conserve cheetahs and other carnivores. It's always such a great honor to be here, and it's such a wonderful inspiration for us to have all of this incredible energy from you, which keeps us going throughout the year. So a huge thanks to everyone here in this room. So yes, we're working with the beautiful, um, uh, beautiful big cat, the cheetahs, in this also wonderful country of Botswana. In Botswana, we have some fabulous opportunities to do conservation for many of the large African uh, mammals that we have in the world today. It has fantastic conservation credentials. Um, we have a government which is committed to wildlife conservation. Um, we have large areas of wilderness, and we have a small human population, a stable democracy, a stable, democracy, a stable economy. Um, and we have some of the largest populations of African wildlife left in the world today. Um, among the highest populations of cheetahs, lions, leopards, wild dogs, elephants, and many others. And so we have a real opportunity to conserve wildlife, African wildlife, for the world, and it's a, it's a responsibility that we take uh, very seriously. And the area that we focus in, where most of the cheetahs are found, we have cheetahs throughout the whole of Botswana, but the main area where the highest densities are, are in this Kalahari region here. Um, so that is where we focus our work. And I had the wonderful opportunity to come to this beautiful land I'd always heard about Botswana, felt that it was a beautiful country. I was lucky enough to grow up in wild places, and I wanted to visit uh, many of the world's last frontiers. And I'd hear about Botswana, and it sounded like this beautiful, unique wilderness area, and I knew that I was going to go there one day. Little I did, did I know that 15 years later, it would be my home. I originally went to a small nature reserve in southern Botswana, uh, Mokolodi Nature Reserve, where one of my jobs was looking after the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center and looking after these two brothers, Duma and Latotsi. Their mother had been killed by a livestock farmer when they were very, very small cubs. So they had been hand-raised, bottle-fed, and they were tame. I met them when they were six years old. Um, I fed them every day, and it was a beautiful relationship. And I fell in love with this incredible um, and this incredible threatened cat. And I thought, well, here we've got these two beautiful ambassador animals. Let's try and partner with a wild cheetah organization that's going on in Botswana. So I looked around, and I was really surprised to discover that there was nothing going on. Um, you know, this elegant, beautiful, fastest cat on earth, um, was often looked at as nothing more than a threat to livestock farmers, and no one was doing any concerted cons conservation for the species. So I looked around Southern Africa, and I asked different cheetah organizations. I got in touch with CCF and De Wilt in South Africa and others, and I thought, do you think there's a need to start something in Botswana? And they said, absolutely. Botswana is in the center of the range of cheetahs in Southern Africa, and we know nothing about the species. You need to start something. So I thought, I'll start up a project for Mokolodi, and then eventually they said, you've got to go independent. And so you know, I started the charity in 2004. And indeed, there's a great need for it. Um, cheetahs have declined a huge amount over the last 100 years, 90% decline um, since 1900. There was 100,000. Now, in 2016, they've declined due to habitat loss, declining prey populations, and, partic and the illegal wildlife trade, and particularly in Botswana, the hum increasing human-wildlife conflict. Um, so we only have about 6,700 cheetahs in the world today. And also, their range has contracted huge amounts. They used to exist throughout the whole yellow region here, even into Arabia and down into India. Um, and due to all those threats, 
their population has contract their range has contracted to 23% of the area of where they used to roam. And we're in a fortunate and important position in southern Africa, in particular between Botswana and Namibia. We have 55% of the world's cheetahs left today. So as I said, it's a really incredible responsibility to conserve these animals. And we work in this wonderful, beautiful, pristine landscape of the delicate Kalahari ecosystem. Um, it's an incredible area uh, of contiguous wildlife areas, linking up protected areas um, throughout the south, south and the west of Botswana. I love it because you can look out and know for hundreds of kilometers um, there's more wildlife than people. And at the moment, and still, there's very little development. It supports incredibly strategically important uh, migratory wildlife species, many different species of antelope, and of course, with a great uh, prey base, um, the predators as well. We have uh, very important populations of uh, cheetahs, wild dogs, lions, leopards, brown hyenas, um, so, yeah, it's a, a very strategic region for linking up um, the protected areas and those populations that are in national parks and reserves that still move through the Kalahari, which is unprotected. And what I think is really exciting is to have a look at this Human Footprint Index map. Um, they've put together um, all the information on human populations, um, roads and development and cities and um, fences, etc., and put that into an index to, of human impact on the landscape. And you can see that, the, that Botswana, and in particular, our focal area here is one of the wildest, most wild natural landscapes in Africa, um, south of the Sahara Desert. So, yeah, it's an incredible area to be working in. And we believe that the cheetah is a fabulous flagship species for this environment. Um, in Botswana, we have around 1,800 cheetahs, about 25% of the cheetahs left today. Um, and 80% of those are outside protected areas. And so their future is completely tied up in how the community perceives them and the ability of human populations to coexist with them. As a wide-ranging, low-density animal, they need huge areas to survive. So they need landscape conservation on a large level. So by conserving cheetahs, we can conserve a lot of other wildlife species and these large landscapes, which are so important. But of course, the biggest threat that we have in the Kalahari region is human-wildlife conflict. We have um, increasing numbers of livestock operations throughout the Kalahari since they started digging deep boreholes in the 1970s and opening up those areas for permanent pasture lands. So people don't protect their livestock as well as they used to in the past, and the retaliatory killings of cheetahs are what are causing significant population declines across southern Africa. So this was the key threat that we decided we had to address in the early days, and we've continued to focus on. And we've started um, a program of holistic conservation. It has to be multifaceted. We have to work with communities and partner. So we do research to better understand the cheetahs, their spit, how many there are, their distribution, um, the threats to their populations. Um, we do farming for conservation, so we work with farmers to reduce the conflict between farming communities and introduce different tools that can enable coexistence. Um, communities for conservation, assisting communities to develop more conservation-compatible livelihoods, and education as well, raising awareness amongst the youth of the nation to ensure that they understand how unique and beautiful Botswana is. Um, <clears throat> so we do this with a fantastic team. We are now 18 people, 14 core staff, two uh, local graduates and two PhD students, um, primarily local people, an absolutely beautiful team. We all love each other very much. We're totally committed to this for the long term. 
We live in this incredible camp in the middle of the Kalahari wilderness. It's very challenging at times. The temperatures can be extremely hot in the summer, very cold in the winter. And I have to take my hat off to the team for living in this challenging environment. And here, just to give you an idea of, um, of the expansiveness of where we live, this is our small camp. That's our office, um, our vehicles. And you can see how remote the area is. And these are our, our houses over here. Um, I want to do a big shout out to Steve Gold um, for organizing our new solar system so that we can actually have power and electricity in these areas and simplify batteries and unirail racks and outback power systems have just donated a fabulous solar system for us so that we can actually live more comfortably in this environment. So, yes, it's an absolutely amazing opportunity to be here and tell you more about the, all of our work. And now I want to introduce you to one of my greatest friends on earth and one of my, and my partner in crime, I mean conservation, um, <laughs> our um, engagement and awareness coordinator, Jane Horgan. Thanks, my love. Which one's the next one? Uh, that one. Yep, so. Cool. Hi guys, I'm so excited to be here. It's just, it brings me so much joy to come and stand here in front of all of you wonderful people and so many of our supporters and share the work that we do with people that love wildlife as much as we do. It's just, it's my happy place right here. So we'd had some really great results come in from the work that we'd done. Um, over the years, we've been monitoring the levels of conflict that are being reported to the Department of Wildlife and National Parks. And we've seen really dramatic declines in conflict, cheetah conflict, in the areas where we've been working. And that got us really excited. You know, at first I thought, great, we're solving this human wildlife conflict issue. I can retire by the age of 40 and I can tick that box and we've saved the species. Great. But it was just a little bit too good to be true. So we, we tried to figure out why is this happening? Is it because there are no more cheetahs left? Is that why people aren't having conflict anymore? But we looked into the cheetah numbers and they were stable in our area. So despite the massive declines that we were seeing elsewhere in, in Africa, where we were working, cheetahs' populations were stable, which was great. And then we thought, maybe the farmers just don't trust us anymore to call us when they're having problems. Maybe they're shooting cheetahs and just not telling us about it. Maybe we've lost that trust. So as the engagement and awareness coordinator for CCB, I felt it was my job to figure out what was going on and engage with the farmers to figure out what was happening. And so we went to the Hunsi Agricultural Show, like we do every year, and it's the premier agricultural event of the country and the social event of the year for the Hunsi district, and a great place to engage with farmers, mostly because they're quite drunk most of the time. <laughs> so they will tell you exactly how they feel about cheetahs and exactly what's going on, including how many of them they may or may not have shot. So we went to the, the agricultural show this year to find out what was going on. I did a very in-depth survey with the farmers, mostly at the bar, and... Um, <laughs> As per normal, most of my work was done involving whiskey, uh, which is very, very important. So, and I found out something just fantastically wonderful. They're not having problems with cheetah anymore. So the vast majority of the farmers I spoke to, in fact, there were only four that were having problems. Everyone else was like, oh yeah, no, we don't have problems with cheetahs anymore. And I was like, that's amazing. What, what happened? And it was because of these guys. So after thousands of years of torment, dogs are finally giving back to cats and saving <laughs> cats. <laughs> so good. So this is Brenda. I, yeah, my mother-in-law actually named this dog. This is Brenda. Um, Brenda is a Swana breed, local breed, livestock guarding dog. And after over 10 years of us preaching to the farmers that livestock guarding dogs are brilliant, they will save your livestock, you won't have to shoot cheetahs anymore. After about 10 years, the Huntsy commercial ranchers finally had started to get the message and everyone is now using them. So even the most challenging farmers that really didn't want to coexist with carnivores, 
now they are using dogs like Brenda. So it just made me so happy that the coexistence is actually happening now. <laughs> So if any of you guys uh, were at the Spring Expo last year, you'll probably remember I was talking about the fact that when it comes to conflict, often you have like a few farmers that will cause like disproportionately large amounts of damage to carnivores. Like you have sort of a few that will shoot a lot. And um, the four farmers that I, I discovered out of this huge group that I, I interviewed at the show, <coughs> slash drank with at the show, um, they, that were still having problems, they were those big fish. So they were guys that we knew had been um, persecuting cheetahs and other carnivores at a large scale in the Hunsi district. And so we have been thinking about ways that we can engage these guys and get these guys to coexist with wildlife. And we actually this year have discovered the secret weapon. So these guys, they don't listen to anybody. They're very... I've been told that the word to use is challenging, but um, they, <laughs> they're quite stubborn. Um, so the, they don't listen to their, their friends, they don't listen to their neighbours, they're certainly not going to listen to me, um, but they listen to one person, and that is their daughters. So this is my daughter, Ava. <laughs> <laughs> The light of my life, but a complete daddy's girl. So she loves my partner much more than she loves me. He gives her everything that she wants, ice cream, toys, trips on the quad bike, you know, every little girl's dream. Um, and, and the father-daughter bond is universal. It happens the world over. And it's exactly the same with the farmers in Hunsi. So the farmers love their daughters, and that is the secret weapon to get through to them. So. Knowing that, we started a really intensive program focusing on the daughters specifically of the, the commercial ranches in this area. So we go to the schools, I wave my arms around a lot um, and try to get the kids excited about cheetahs. Uh, we run competitions. This, you know, guess the number of jelly beans. That was the number of jelly beans was the exact number of cheetahs in Botswana. This girl is the grand, she won. She was the granddaughter of one of those big fish, one of those farmers that shoots a lot of stuff. I swear I didn't rig it. <laughs> it was just a happy coincidence that she won. And we got this guy on board. This uh, cheetah mascot was donated by Clarissa Clendendon from uh, Wildlife Safari, and we use him to engage with the kids. This is quite a unique thing in Botswana. And we just try to get these kids falling in love with cheetahs. And it was working quite well, I have to say. Um, and we were also, <laughs> at the show also, give it, we can get these stickers at our stall if you come visit us, um, giving these stickers out to all of the, the daughters in the community, and they've ended up on all of the safari vehicles of their dads. <laughs> <laughs> Which you can imagine they're really excited about. <laughs> but there was one of these big fish that was... Um, he was having a lot of conflict. He was shooting a lot of carnivores. Um, he was in an unfortunate area in the district that was quite close to the central Kalahari Game Reserve. Lots of carnivores moving through his farm. Lots of issues. Um, so we started work. We have been working with him for quite a while. This is 2009. Uh, any of you that remember Max um, working to relocate this leopard on the farm? And we thought, OK, well, maybe we need to start talking to his daughter. And his daughter was going to that school um, that I mentioned. And so we were engaging with her. Um, we translocated some cheetahs off his farm, one of the few successful translocations that we've had. It doesn't usually work, but these guys were lucky and they made it. And then in January, we, this cheetah was caught by the Department of Wildlife and relocated off the farm. We put a tracking collar on her just to see if she survived, because the survival rates are less than 20%. Um, so we wanted to see what happened, and I tell you, this cat went on an epic journey, and the coolest part about this is that they, they named her after the farmer's daughter. <laughs> Stroke of genius. I mean, I was actually thinking, this could really backfire on us, right? <laughs> if this cat dies, like, this, she's, she's 11. You know, she would have been devastated if this cat dies. So, anyway, we, the department, they, we, 
she was caught on this farm in the blue, uh, released into the central Kalahari game reserve, uh, went on this epic journey that GJ is telling me I have to hurry up, but it's such an amazing story. She went on this huge trip. We were really worried. She started coming back towards Huntsy District. That's where most cheetahs get shot. Okay, so we were really starting to worry. And then she came down and settled north of their farm. At this stage, the farmer and the daughter wanted her back on their farm. <laughs> they got, we were sending them these GPS points. They got so invested in this that they, like, they were like, no, she can come back. She can even eat some of our cattle. That's fine. <laughs> we just want her home. But then, uh, but then her points stopped moving on this farm to the north, which is another one of these big fish that loves to shoot cheetahs. And so a week went by, no movement, two weeks, three weeks, and the points hadn't moved. We were like, okay, how are we gonna break this news to a leader that her cheetah is now dead? But then, a few, like, several weeks later, Leanne, our research coordinator, looks up the points and discovers this. He goes, oh my god. So can you guess what happened? Yeah, zombie cheetah, that's right. <laughs> like Game of Thrones, like White Walkers. Like, she, had, she had the blue eyes and everything. No, she'd had cubs and she just did not move. And then the best part, she went back to that farm and now they're looking after her and we're so happy. So now all we're waiting for is the farmer that's, uh, the farmer's in the farm north of her. She still does occasionally go into that farm. Um, he just got married, so we're really hoping that he'll have a daughter and we'll be able to fix that problem as well. <laughs> so I'll hand it back to Rebecca to tell you about the rest of our work. Thank you. Yeah, so really inspiring story and incredibly well told, Jane. Um, so yeah, absolutely wonderful success there with some of the fenced ranches. Also doing a lot of work with the communal farmers. These are more subsistence level farmers uh, that are living more kind of hand to mouth and don't have a lot of spare um, funding and money. And as we mentioned, the Livestock Guarding Dog Program is one of our signature successful stories. The, the puppies come to our farm where they're trained. Um, and then when they're ready, they get placed out um, with farmers experiencing high levels of conflict. Um, they're extremely effective. They work incredibly well. They bond to the livestock and they protect them out in the veld. Um, predators are looking for an easy meal, so they'll rarely, um, they'll rarely sort of front up to these animals. So really, really effective tool. Um, another success story, this is Mr. Moyo. He was having so many cheetah problems. He had 30 goats. They almost all disappeared. He would have, and would have in the past, killed the, that cheetah that was preying on his goats. He decided to give us a call, and we gave him two livestock guarding dogs, um, Mossadi and Brown, and they have reduced his losses to absolutely zero. And he's become one of our spokespersons. We have this fantastic farmers network of engaged and interested farmers and also our livestock guarding dog recipients. We bring them together regularly to share their information and do peer-to-peer -peer learning so that they can train other farmers how to farm sustainably in this environment. And we do exchanges to their farms so people can learn all of those best practices. And just a shout out to our com community outreach team. For all of this work, they were nominated as the Disney Conservation Heroes earlier this year. So we're really, really proud of them for that achievement. And as I was saying, just winding up, I am winding up. Um, you know, we talked about landscape level conservation. Um, the last group that we're working with are in these wildlife management areas here. These two communities of Bere and Kakai. This is still a movement corridor for wildlife, although it's narrowing at the edges um, due to livestock farming operations. And we've been working with these communities, Kalahari San, Bushman, um, they're incredible hunter-gatherer people. We brought the whole community together, the chiefs and the development committees for the villages, etc., and done participatory planning to see where do they want their future to be? What kind of livelihoods do they want? And we were really encouraged that they don't want to be livestock farmers. They want to generate their income from conservation-compatible 
um, livelihoods based on their natural resources, their beautiful landscapes, their indigenous knowledge with cultural tourism. They have incredible abilities with beautiful jewelry. They have a load of, lot of different medicinal plants and teas. So there's a lot of opportunities for them to develop livelihoods and benefit from their natural resources so that they can live in harmony with wildlife and see a value in wildlife. We want to make sure that these beautiful people of the Kalahari have choices in their lives. If they wish to be livestock farmers, they'll know how to do it as sustainably as possible. If they, and if they want to benefit from their natural resources, they'll have a range of livelihood options. If they want to join us as conservationists, we'll have opportunities for them too. And ensure that these beautiful landscapes and wildlife are conserved for the future generations of the Earth and throughout, because Botswana has an important role to play. And my personal inspiration, in part, is my, my young six-year-old daughter, Eleni. She loves wildlife. She, um, she's showing every sign to want to follow in my footsteps. And I want her to grow up with hope that this beautiful land of wilderness and wildlife will remain for her as she grows and for her children as well. Um, and I want to be able to look into her eyes and know that I'm doing everything that I can with my incredible team to ensure that cheetahs, carnivores, and the beautiful people of the Kalahari in this wonderful wilderness is conserved for the future. So thank you very much for all of your support.